partners in daily life, they're there all the time and, um, and I love to see them and, uh, and yeah, I certainly um, I, I enjoy their company every day. See the first snow petrels when the, when the ice fields come into view, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch it, see the different birds in different areas, different parts of the ocean. They'll follow us from, from here to South America and uh, we'll see albatrosses and, and uh, all, all sorts of um, mollyhawks that sort of migrate with us. No doubt they carry on around the globe and catch up with us on the other side again. It, I, can't, I can't imagine what it would be like without seabirds. Well, there's 21 species of albatrosses in the world and a large number of petrel species and they're especially adapted to flight. Albatrosses have got very long wingspans relative to their body weight. They can travel vast distances in search of food. They can see fishing vessels as a source of vast amounts of potentially free food. Seabirds are vulnerable to mortality in fisheries because of their life history characteristics. Generally speaking, they take a long time to reach maturity. In the case of the wandering albatross, they mightn't reach maturity until they're 10 or 12 years of age. When they do breed, they only lay a single egg. And with some species, they may only breed every second or third year. Fisheries have had a devastating impact on populations over the years. For example, in the albatross populations at South Georgia, they've been decreasing for over 50 years at 1 or 2% a year due to mortality in fisheries. Seabirds are caught in longline fisheries when baited hooks are paid out from the stern of vessels. Uh, there's vast numbers of baited hooks paid out during setting operations and seabirds dive on the baited hooks, get uh, hooked in the bill or they swallow the hook and it catches them in the esophagus or they might get snagged in the wing and they get drawn underwater and drown. The best way to avoid seabirds is to sink the line as quickly as you possibly can. Historically the way to do that was to use these manually weighted lines. Each one of these is around about five or six kilograms and the, uh, the crew will stick one of these on, clip it onto the line as it's going out, probably around about every 50 metres. The problem with this is there's a lot of labour required to hook it on in the first instance, to take it off when the line's being hauled again and then to move, physically move this weight from the uh, bow of the vessel to the stern of the vessel. Seabird scientists did trial work by adding little bits of lead into a long line to see if they get a better sink profile. No weights, just regular. You can see how the silver line just goes beneath the surface and just hovers there, sinking very slowly. Long line with integrated weight, as soon as it hits the water and goes quite deep quickly. So the new system is integrated weighted line. Lead beads inserted into some of the strands of the backbone um, and it also gives firmness to the line so the crew prefer to use it so it sits nicely in the in coils and the racks here. It is um, better at not catching seabirds and it is easier for the crew to use, to use it on board the boat. So it's a, it's a great success, this line. To develop or apply a new technology like this, obviously you require a, a collaborative fishing company and we were very open-minded and keen to find a solution to this problem. We had a f engineering company in Norway that makes fishing gear. We had uh, a source of funding that was adequate and also the other element of the equation is the scientific organisation, which is the Australian Antarctic Division. Seabirds are at risk around trawlers from t two sources. The, the warps that tow the net through the water, and they're wire ropes, and they can injure the birds or pull them underwater and kill them. Or the net, when it's on the surface, being hauled back to the boat or shot away, the birds can enter the net and become tangled or drowned within the net itself. Managing the risk to seabirds is no different really to managing the risk to anything else, except we cannot manage seabirds, we can manage people. I knew a lot about food safety management measures that are required on trawlers, plus crew and vessel safety management measures. So we just took the same model and just said, crew on these vessels understand safe ship management, they understand food safety protocols and procedures, so we'll develop an offal management seabird safety regime that's very similar. Initial attempts 
that the industry had made had failed quite miserably because there was no follow-up. And so this time it was about follow-up. Concepts, delivery, implementation, and then persistent follow-up. So it became a full-time job, really, to be on top of this for the deep water fleet of 30 to 40 vessels. And so now we have a process where the government has in its own hands a copy of all of the risk management plans on all of the vessels in our fleet. And when an observer goes to sea on the vessels, and that's 25 to 40, 50 percent of all the deep water vessels are observed at any one time, they will fill out an audit form and return it back to us so that we can see that we've had an independent audit of our own processes and that gives us feedback to give back to the vessels themselves. We've been approached by Australia and they've applied that to their smaller trawl vessel fleet in a, in a more simplified form but the philosophy and concept is very much the same and we stay in contact with them on that and also we've been to South Africa and discussed that with WWF BirdLife International and the fishing industry there and they've also embraced it and are currently installing it across their middle depth trawl fleet, the hate fleet and I'm getting feedback from them that it's uh, working in the same way that it's been working here. The sorts of changes we're seeing now, uh, skippers walking into our office and talking to us about the fact that they didn't catch a bird last trip, whereas five years ago they only would have told us how much fish they caught, and, and certainly feedback from the observer program. They see the deck crew and, and the officers of the vessels have got a better understanding of what the risks are and, and what their role is in solving those problems. Smart solutions are always being developed. A skipper can't do it all himself. He has to have help from his mates and bosuns and leading hands. And then companies and, and, and then the whole community comes on board. Quería el bacalao de profundidad o toothfish en inglés que eh, se desarrolla en el sur de Magallanes. Es una pesquería de espinel que tenía una mortalidad incidental de alrededor, en promedio 1.550 albatros por año y las colonias que se desarrollan en los alrededores estaban tremendamente disminuidas. Eh, nos dimos cuenta que la principal motivación de los pescadores no era el tema de la interacción con las aves, sino era el tema de que los cachalotes eh, sacaban mucha, muchos peces de la línea, produciendo un daño económico a la actividad pesquera. Entonces, eh, la principal motivación de los pescadores era solucionar ese problema. Descubrimos que había una pesquería eh, artesanal eh, que, a pesar de calar un alto número de anzuelos, jamás mató ningún pájaro marino. Y entonces nosotros tomamos este ejemplo y se lo mostramos a la industria y a partir de esta idea, que era, muy, era eliminar la línea madre, dejar solamente la línea principal con la línea secundaria, con un peso abajo y poner todos los anzuelos a lo largo de esa línea, eso fue la primera, el primer paso. Enseguida, uno de los um, <coughs> eh, capitanes de pesca se le ocurrió eh, colocar unas fibras de cuerdas eh, alrededor de los anzuelos para esconderlos, cosa que cuando eh, esconder los anzuelos, de tal manera que cuando retiraran la línea, los cachalotes no vieran los peces. Y por eso eh, a este nuevo arte de pesca, los pescadores le, lo bautizaron como cachalotera, que es la traducción del inglés sperm whale, que es cachalote. Si uno compara hoy día la situación anterior con la actual, la, todas las colonias han aumentado el número de eh, nidos activos en más de un 30%. Without the collaboration, if you took away one of the parties, whether it was the fishery scientist or whether it was New Zealand Ministry of Fisheries or obviously ourselves and the fishing gear suppliers, then this whole thing wouldn't have got off the ground. Yo creo que sin un trabajo colaborativo entre científicos y pescadores, no podría haber habido ninguna solución. Collaborations become one of our most important tools. 
we can't install s systems without government support and the government systems don't work without our support and, and both parties recognise that now. We've won our battle and uh, the challenge now is really to, to pass it on for others to do the same and uh, it's, not, it's not difficult at all, it's really, it's really quite easy and it makes you feel real good when you get it right.